everything's learned that great toils are coming on the people of God. And he's also learned that the toils will end with the deliverance of God. God will come. But still, they will be tough at the time. There's trouble coming. And above all, and of by far the greatest importance, he learned in chapter 2, verse 4, the key to persisting and enduring through the coming judgment for the people of God who will be judged. Do, do you want to hear what the key to persisting through tribulations are? Because he's got it. For those living through the consequences of judgment on theirs and their people's sin, the key to persevering through that experience is this, Habakkuk 2.4, the enemy is puffed up, his desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. So go and be faithful! How does that work? Does it work? Does it help to be told to go and be faithful? No, this is a problem. Because that's what happens all the time, isn't it? Preachers get up and they say, go and do this, go and do this. And it's all very well, but how do I do that? People be inspiring to do that. How do you keep that faithful? How do you get inspired to be faithful through the sorts of... You've, you've read the stuff. You've seen what's here in Habakkuk chapter 3. You've seen how difficult it's going to be to be faithful through the sort of things that are going to happen to them. How do you inspire that faithful response? How do you keep it faithful? How do you keep God's people faithful as they live through the hard consequences of their own sin and God's judgment on it? How do you keep their outlook in order and, and keep them faithful so they live? The righteous will live by his faithfulness. See, Habakkuk well knows the importance of the arts. The arts are important at a time when people are under pressure. And he knows the importance of the arts for tending people's worldview. And he knows the importance of songs for morale and for encouragement. So when they've got all this coming on them, and it's the faithful who will live, Habakkuk says, we're going to have to keep you there. How are we going to keep you there? Hear the song. And he writes them a psalm. See, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigianoth, that could be a psalm of David on Shigianoth, wouldn't it? That's the way you start the psalm. And then at the end, what's, what's he got at the end? On my stringed instruments. Right? For the director of music, on my string. What do you get at the end of a psalm? Something like that. Habakkuk is consciously giving them a song. What the people of God need is a song. The right sort of song, this song. A song to keep their hearts faithful to God so that they will go on and live. Now, nowhere else in the, in the Hebrew Bible do you get a prophet writing a song for the covenant community. It's the Levites. But what's going to happen to the Levites? And what's going to happen to the temple when the Babylonians come in? They're going to be obliterated. The prophets are going to be what you've got left. Nowhere else does it happen as a prophet to write a psalm like this. But that's not to say the idea has never been done before. Habakkuk's been commissioned to write his prophecy of the end of the nation state and the coming of the kingdom of God. He's been encouraged to write it all onto tablets of stone just like Moses. And it was Moses who, who God told to write a psalm about all this and place it in the mouths of the Israelites as they wandered about and as they wandered off from God and all the rest of it as a vehicle to instruct future generations and keep them inspired. It's all very well for preachers to stand up and say, you've got to be faithful. You need to inspire people to be faithful and to persevere, don't you? That's what Habakkuk is about. So chapter 2 of Habakkuk ended with the comment that the Lord was in his holy temple. And now Habakkuk sets out a psalm designed for communal temple worship. A psalm they can remember in the long days of subjection to a foreign power after the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. And there they are. You remember that, that you know, in the Psalter psalm, uh, by the rivers, rivers of Babylon, we sat down, we wept, when we remembered Zion. It's obliterated. They tried to make us sing a song. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? 
Here you go. Here's the song that will keep you faithful. And Habakkuk's with me, the, the prophet. Here you go. And there are those left behind in a defeated, sacked, pillaged Judah. How can they sing? How can they keep up their morale? How can the righteous suffering such judgment even live with it all day by day? The just shall live by his faithfulness. Oh, it's all very well for you to say that, and it's true, but sing with me. Sing with me. See? Habakkuk 3 is a psalm outside the temple, a psalm outside the Psalter. Outside that temple that will shortly be destroyed anyway, a psalm that is written with a clear pastoral purpose to help the people live faithfully through the terrible consequences of God's judgment. What's the theme of this psalm? It's going to be some kind of psalm, isn't it? Got it. The theme of this psalm in Habakkuk 3 is a great big pastoral poetic exposition of the key to it all in Habakkuk 2 4. The just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk starts out with the prayer to be praying as you're trying to live by faith through calamity. Here comes the prayer then. Verse 2. The introduction shows you it's a psalm. All that stuff about pig being off and all that. I don't know what that is. Nobody knows what that is. I guess. No idea. But it's, it's what you get with a psalm. That's what we know. So that's verse 1. Verse 2. God is coming. Pray for mercy. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. When the foundations are shaken in the heat of tribulation, Habakkuk puts this prayer into the mouths of the people. He takes them back to the history of the people of God. Now that is really important. When they're having a bad day, and everything looks lost and hopeless. You know, there are times when you really need to go back to the history of the people of God and say, God has done this before. God has done this before. Those days of the exile were terrible days. God looked after his people. God held his people. Those days when persecution broke, broke out against the Jerusalem church, God protected his people. Those days after the crucifixion, six weeks had gone by, nothing had happened. Jesus had been raised and he wandered around, but, but what now? And what and we lost? And, and the Spirit came and painted. In the days of Peter and James and John, things were tough, things were difficult. In the days of Paul, locked up, ostracized, silenced, apparently, but not. Lord, I've heard of your fame. Peter, banged up in jail, caged preacher. God sends an angel, opens the door of the prison, takes him out and preaches in, in the temple. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. In our time, make them know. In wrath, Lord, remember mercy. He takes them back to the history of the people of God. He secures their souls to the God who's intervened in history in the past. He anchors them there to their God by calling for reflection on the past deeds of God. And the reality of hard experience is going to come upon those people and it's going to press him hard. But the reality is that their God has a history. Our God. A covenant-keeping God has a covenant-keeping track record. It is famous. It is awe-inspiring. Our God has done great things and holy is his name. But far from dwelling on the past. In order to escape from the things we don't like in the present. That's not what Habakkuk is doing, is he? He says, do them again. Do it now that time. He's not dwelling on the past. He's looking at this and he's saying, the past is a time to remember, but it is no place to live. In your wrath and our sin, remember mercy, do it now. When things are tough for God's people, here's what you need to do. Recall the past deeds of God, so let me just stop there. Recall the past deeds of God, and secondly, plead with him who doesn't ever change, do it again, and show his great mercy now. In our time, make this known. In our time, in the midst of the years, between the ages, you know, have a it says they're literally between the ages. Habakkuk has got two things going on. He's got this prophecy that terrible times are going to come on people of God because of their sin, they're rebelling against him. And then he's got this tremendous prophecy of judgment on those who come in judgment. You know, he's got this redemption is coming, but there'll be a gap. There'll be that intervening age. In the midst of the years. In the midst of the years. In 
in our time. Make it known. And in wrath remember mercy. It, it doesn't say in wrath. It, it says in the days of trembling remember mercy. It's asking God to remember his mercy in the days of progress, excitement, agitation, disturbance, in troubled times. Remember mercy. So the, the prayer here then, that begins the whole thing, kicks the whole thing off in verse 2. The prayer goes like this, that the Lord will preserve life, repeating his old deeds today, that the Lord will provide understanding in our time, make them known. Literally that says, make him understand. Thirdly, that the Lord will remember mercy. In days of disturbance, remember your mercy. Only that is going to meet these people's need. Only God stepping in is going to meet their need. It's not that they need this, that they, they need God. And then the psalm now moves forward to what's coming. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Secondly, God is coming. Fearsome glory. God is coming, prayer for mercy. God is coming in fearsome glory, verses 3 to 7. There is this tendency, isn't there, in our culture to think of and to treat the presence of God as, as, as something like a bit of a cuddle up with a favourite cushion. You know, favourite blanket. Something cosy. The presence of God is a holy presence. And for people like us, it's an awesome presence. And, and Habakkuk full well knows that his footsteps shake the mountains. Habakkuk then, verses 3 to 7. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. I can't help, I can't help having sort of Star Wars um, in the back of my head here. It's all that stuff that goes on, the pyrotechnics, you know, all that. But it's real power, not fake, like on the films. Rays flashed out from his hand where his power was hidden. That's interesting. There are terrible times coming on the people of God, you see. And it's going to look like his power is hidden. Power is hidden in his hand. It comes a time when those rays flash out. It's still there. His power is hidden. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth, he looked and made the nations tremble. God coming is the answer. God coming is the inspiring answer. So from Teman, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Uh, Teman to Paran covers the route of the Exodus up to Sinai, the game of the God brought them from Exodus to the gateway of the promised land. But the big shock is not his route. The big shock is that he comes. Isn't it? He comes. Moses saw the coming of God as the key to things. Deuteronomy 33 too. The coming of God to his people is the source of hope for them. Because his purposes are redeeming purposes. And he redeems his people in order ultimately to restore them. God's coming. It's the first thing. Second thing, verse 4, those rays that flash from his hand, it's fascinating. Keren is the Hebrew, it means horns. Horns flash from his hand. Mm -hmm. It's not that. This is not Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle things, whatever they're called. Yeah, thing of the past. It's not that. The horn symbolizes the concentration of power, whether it's on the front of an animal or whether it's in God. Strength. A ray of light emitted from its source, it's used for that as well. But again, this is another allusion from Habakkuk to God's powerful days in Israel's past with Moses. Now, remember, this oracle is written down on tablets. You know, it's got all that running through it. Moses runs right through this. Moses descended from Sinai in Exodus 34. And this word, horns, is the one he used to describe the shining of rays of light from his face. He's been in the presence of God. And, and the presence of God has affected his face. And light shines from his face. The same word is used. It, it horns from his face. The glory of God is about him. There's more to link those two passages, this one with Exodus 34, but I'm going to bog it down in all that detail. Light shines from 
his hand, where it has been hidden. See, notice that verse 4, the hand hides the power in their hard days of captivity, but the power is still there, awaiting that day. Now, living by your faithfulness means you live like you know that. His power is hidden in his hand. But he's done away to be shown to him. And by the end of verse 7, when God <coughs> moves to rescue his people at the end of the time of affliction, the judgment of God against the nations is well underway. They need to realise during their afflictions that verse 7 is where they're headed. God is coming. His fierce and glory will be revealed and that will have huge effects in creation and huge effects on the wicked who've been afflicted. Okay. That coming of God. God is coming in fierce and glory. That God is coming then thirdly has fearsome effects. Verses 8 to 15. Verses 8 to 15. Coming of God has fearsome effects in the creation. And there's all this stuff about uh, <clears throat> calling for his bow and calling for many arrows and splitting the earth with the rivers and the mountains saw you and Roy, the torrents of water and the sun and moon stood still and, 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 and striding through the earth and threshing. What's it about? Is it, is it about um, climate change? This section of Habakkuk 3 has got, got all sorts of poetic and structural things going on in it. Motifs from the culturally ancient world, references to ancient Near Eastern myths and whatnot. It's all very interesting if we had the time. But the fundamental point that's of use to us is this. When God marches out into the world with powerful effects in the creation, he isn't coming to judge streams or rivers or any of the other parts of the inanimate creation. Those things are unsettled by the presence of his awesome glory. That's a side effect. Merely incidental byproducts of his purpose. His power unveiled has all sorts of effects in the creation, yeah. But the purpose of his coming is not to create huge effects in creation, but to deliver his people and save his anointed one. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Of course not. Of course not. Was your wrath against the streams? Obvious answer, no. Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? And then you're sort of picking up bits of, you know, Pharaoh and his chariots and the Red Sea and all the rest of it. No, no, no. You came out to deliver your people, verse 13, to save your anointed one. There is the point. We're getting to the number of the matter, and I'm just going to press on and leave all that interesting poetry behind. Because there is no doubt in Habakkuk's mind that the coming of the glorious holy God into his creation could have major effects on it. Yes, it is. But the way to ride out the storm is very clear in Habakkuk's theology. The righteous shall live through it all by his faithfulness. There's terrible effects in creation. These awful things going on in the world. The righteous shall live through it by his faithfulness. So here comes the resolution of the matter. In the triumph of Habakkuk's resolve to walk in faithfulness. God is coming. Triumphant trust. Verses 16 to 19. I heard all this going on. My lips quivered at the sound. I just like to be in that sort of state. Decay crept into my bones. Oh, my legs trembled. Physical effects on Habakkuk. The awesome presence of God and the effects in creation. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of come. I'm at it to come on the nation in babies. Yet we've got all this going on. But I'm going to wait because I know God. He's going to call to account the people who are troubling us. I'm going to play the long game. That's what faith is. Faithfulness plays the long game. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the food fields produce no food, no sheep in the sheepfold, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God my Saviour. Here's faithfulness. Faithfulness doesn't uh, grit its teeth and move on. Faithfulness praises God in calamity. Perseverance, Christian perseverance, is not bearing it and grinning. It's actually rejoicing in the God who's got it in his hand. And will bring it to its conclusion. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will. 
God my Savior. We'll see how in a minute. But that's a big ask. See, Habakkuk is justified to be petrified about what's coming. His heart is justified in pounding. His lips are justified in quivering. It, you know, the fact that he feels like he's got decay in his bones and he just can't stand up under it all. Uh, the legs trembling beneath him. There are going to be terrible days to go through. And all he can do, all they can do, is to seek to live faithfully through it. Three elements make up this last section of this chapter here, verses 16 to 19. Has fear of what's coming quickly turns to triumphant trust. Firstly, verse 16, Habakkuk responds in stunned awe. All this stuff about his heart pounding and his bones rotting and all that. Actual physical experience that he undergoes as the full weight of the significance of the vision dawns on him. His solar plexus convulses, locks up. His efforts to dialogue with the Almighty grind to a halt in an uncontrollable buzzing of his lips, it says in the Hebrew. While his bones feel like they're rotting away as his legs tremble beneath him. <clears throat> you know, four times in this chapter, verse 2, verse 7, twice in verse 16, trembling is the response to the coming of God. He's awesome. And it's stunning to me. It stuns me. Just as at the Exodus, the nations of the earth heard and trembled at the report of God's mighty works, Exodus 15, verse 14. So now this news of approaching judgment from God, it prompts similar trembling. Why in particular? It's because of the terrible devastation that God's people must undergo before they fully possess the promises of God. And because of that, the prophet trembles to the core of his being. He's stunned and in awe by the coming of God. And secondly, the second thing that happens here, there's the response of stunned awe. And secondly, there's the recognition, verse 17, of coming loss. Habakkuk is not being unrealistic about what's coming. He's very realistic about what's happening. He's gripped by the scale of the coming losses. Rehearses the items that will be denied to the inhabitants of the land. He sets it out very poetically. It's set out in, in the form of three stanzas, four lines each. And within that, there's a double triad. Uh, that'll be more interesting to us. What's this double triad? The first double triad is concerned with optional things. And the second triad is concerned with human essentials. So, this verse we know probably about the fig tree and the fruit and the olive. They're the luxury, choice products of the land that God gave to the Hebrews so they could have good things in that land when they got there. Rejoice in the material blessings of the land. Luxury states to these items, fig, fruit, olive. Old Palmer Robinson is normally quite staid, I think he's Presbyterian or something like that, so in America he, he says, quote, I thought this, the absence of these, I can't do the accent, I mustn't do the accent, it doesn't work. The absence of these items, these luxury items, means no fig cakes, no wine, no anointing oil for the sun-baked lady. Can you just imagine the sun-baked lady? What a way to put it. None of those are luxury things. But then there's the second triad. The grain of the fields, the flocks and the cattle. Fruits of the land of a quite different nature. These are the source of necessities like bread and meat. See, Habakkuk, in contrast to that wilderness generation that came out of Egypt and found they lacked these things and grumbled. Habakkuk, on the other hand, recognises the coming loss of both necessities and luxuries that's coming, but he believes and he trusts nonetheless. Which the wandering Israelites at first couldn't give him a bit. The promised judgment is coming, but the promised mercies of God are coming too. And these extend well beyond those material losses that are to be anticipated that are coming first. How can you do that? How can, how can Habakkuk have that sort of sense of recognising coming loss but looking beyond? But, well, <clears throat> you know, God had not led them to believe anything else would happen. The laws of Moses had described what would happen if the people didn't heed God and then despised all his chastenings. And what the law of Moses says that if you do that, then the land will not yield its increase. It's in, it's in Leviticus 26. There you go, nice little Leviticus on a Sunday morning. 
It's all there, and more, in the book. If, the, if after all this you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. Your strength will be spent in vain, because your soul will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of your land, land yield their fruit. And then, on he goes about the cattle and the sheep and stuff like that. It's there, and more, in the book. Why is it that people do what God says that we shouldn't do, and then expect God not to do what he says he then will? You know, this whole thing about continuing to do the same thing and expecting different results. What's in the land? Why do you carry on? Well, it sounds like those days in the garden where the serpent promoted fruit eating. And he began with, did God really say? Habakkuk knows his Old Testament. Habakkuk has heard clearly from God. He knows about the sins of his people. He recognised the losses and the hard days to come. How is he going to handle that? How is he going to keep faithful? How is he going to help them to keep faithful? <coughs> Verses 16 to 19. Firstly, there's this response of son Lord. Secondly, there's this recognition of coming loss. Verse 17. And then thirdly, there's this resolution of joyous trust, verses 18 to 19. I've got as far as this in Habakkuk, a really very poetic book, so carefully structured. I've managed to do that without blocking out the parallelism, parallelism of text at any point, and I've just, I've just given in. Look, here it is. Yet I in Yahweh, I shall exult, I shall rejoice in the God of my salvation. Yahweh my God is my salvation. For he will set my feet like high and sweet, and on my high places he will make me walk. Clearly, chiastic structure. It's, it's cleverly done to emphasize Yahweh, my God, is my strength. There's the point at the center of this structuring of that set of verses there, verses 18 to 19. There is the resolution of the conflict that began the book. See, at the outset, Habakkuk goes off among the God because he can't handle. The sinfulness of the land and its defiance of God, where the wicked are being allowed, if not encouraged, to prosper. But then God responded to Habakkuk, his, second, uh, second, uh, his first response to Habakkuk, and he says the situation is going to get worse. I'm going to do this. I'm already working on it. I'm setting about this already. And then Habakkuk came back and he said, oh, that's awful, that's terrible. And God has to deal with him again. And then God met with Habakkuk again and spoke to him again about the realities of the situation, the coming of redemption after days of tribulation and judgment. And there'd be a pause in which the people of God would be conquered and pressed and scattered. But then after that, after that purging and cleansing and rearranging, there'd be a day of salvation. But nonetheless, those hard days of affliction and tribulation would have to be endured before the coming of God in glory, what we've been reading about here, to judge the living and the dead and to bring redemption to his faith. People. How would his faithful people persevere through those dark days before redemption? The justified by faith will live by his steadfast trust. And so here in this passage, the prophet resolves to trust. And in this passage, the prophet rejoices in what? In the fact that redemption is coming? It's not, is it? He's rejoicing in the God who brings redemption. See? In Yahweh I shall exalt. In Yahweh I shall rejoice. In Yahweh the God of my salvation. Jehovah my God is my strength. Rejoicing in Him. Now that's important. We rejoice in our God, not the things He gives us. And that's the difference between faith and idolatry. Rejoicing in the Creator God, not in the things He gives along with everybody else is going to be caught up in the whirlwind of judgment he too is going to suffer the loss of all manner of material things whether it's fig trees or bread but he can rejoice in the faith he has in his God in Yahweh I shall exalt I shall rejoice in the God of my salvation my God is my strength Jehovah my God is my strength the transition from complaining prophet to worshipping believer is immense. It's a work of the sovereign grace of the covenant-keeping God. But Habakkuk looks out at incoming calamity and he sees God's victory beyond it. He sees the God who will be victorious beyond it because, as he says here, Jehovah my God is my strength. Here we go. 
seeking other strengths finds weakness. Relying on such other creative strength causes tragedy. He will set my feet like hind feet, and on my high places he will make me walk. <clears throat> Tell you a story. Early last week I was puffing up a hill on a steep bank on my own, trying to flush sheep out of a very deep bracket. And I, I'd walked up this. <laughs> I'd walked up uh, pretty near the top. I was sort of working my way back then across sort of seven acres of the way up the hill, working my way across then on the contour, coming back through this bracket. The bracket was high, it's difficult to walk to. Uh, by then I was, I was uh, glowing a little and I was puffing quite a lot. And uh, I got maybe a third of the way along the top. And uh, pretty near the top of the hill, but I was coming across sideways. But a third of the way along, I heard a rustling and a stirring. It didn't sound or smell like sheep, okay? That's all I can tell you. Didn't sound or smell like sheep, and there was this rustling and stirring and movement in the undergrowth. And a big foul stag stood up, I kid you not, 20 feet from him. He was having his afternoon nap, and I disturbed him. And there he was, he stood up, and it was ant as the works, okay? Full nine yards. And I was thinking, I'd love to have that in the, in the, in the freeze. I wasn't. I was thinking, oh boy! <laughs> what on earth is this? He was huge. And, as I said, I disturbed his afternoon nap. And he was up and he was awake. If he'd, gone, if he'd come towards me, it would be in real trouble. But he was just away, clearing hundreds of yards in seconds through really thick bracken. And he just popped over the fence. Hundreds of yards off. Yeah. Oh, over the fence got. I was puffing, but he wasn't puffing. He will set my feet like fine feet, but on my high places he will make. There was no lack of stamina in the stag. There was no lack of stamina in that stag. He is my God. He is my, my strength. He makes my feet like that stag's feet. No puffing. And the strength to endure. The days that come. So before our very eyes, then, by way of conclusion, we were waiting for that word, weren't you? So before our very eyes, the message of Habakkuk finds fulfilment. Habakkuk faces awful calamity, terrible privations, and the disgrace that comes with being the prophet of the God whose people are conquered. But the message is lived out, and it's lived through with, and its burden finds fulfilment. As Habakkuk, as, the, as he leads the people of God to meet what comes with faithfulness and inspires them to do that. The kingdom of God lies ahead of him. He doesn't know its leader. It's going to be inaugurated in the fulfillment of, of, of the time at the end of the era of darkness, pointing forward to the time still awaited of the greatest fulfillment of all. The time is going to come in Revelation when, when heaven's cry is going to ring out Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. People will come and look upon her in a fallen state. When the times finally reach the awesome, total fulfillment. But until then, Revelation, until then, dark days still cloud the horizon of the Lord's faithful people. They do. When you're not faithful, it means you need. Oh, Habakkuk, look what's happening. The heavens seem to be caving right in, yes, says, says Habakkuk. But Yahweh, my God, is my strength. He enables me to persevere in faithfulness. And the righteous one. 